Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Corey Lahiri. It is good to be with you. Thank you for joining us for online worship today. Hey, it's going to be a good time of worship. I hope the, the service will encourage you, bless you. I hope you'll get something out of the message today. We're going to have a couple of minutes here coming up where you can uh, text somebody, send somebody a message, call somebody, call somebody from the other room, say, hey, come join me for worship. Uh, you can use this time to settle your heart, light a candle, get ready, ready your space, ready your mind to worship. But you got a couple of minutes before we hear some announcements and get ready to worship our God together. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Seavers, the Connection Director here at Police Federated Church, and I'm so glad you could join us for worship today. We're going to have a few video announcements for you, but before we get to those, I want to share with you about our Lamp and Light Journey Scripture Memorization verse for this week. As many of you know, uh, this summer we are uh, continuing the Lamp and Light Journey, uh, trying to encourage you to be uh, involved in the Scriptures, reading the Scriptures, and memorizing the Scripture, hiding God's Word in your heart. Uh, this year, all of our verses relate to our comeback series. And uh, this, this week's verse is from 2 Chronicles 20, 20b. It says, Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. So uh, it's a great encouragement for us to believe in the Lord our God, and uh, we will succeed. So I hope you can uh, take that verse with you this week. If you uh, would like a copy of it, we have the cards here at the church. You can pick one up throughout the week. They're great to post around your house, put in your Bible as a bookmark, or even send uh, a postcard note to a friend. So with that being said, take a look at these uh, announcements, and then we'll have our call to worship. Hi, I'm Betty Sawyer. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about our Bible studies that we're holding in person in most cases. And it's just so fun to get together and read about these big comebacks that are stronger than setbacks. Like this week we were talking about Elijah and how he needed a still small voice of God to come to him. It's just um, so good to get together with others and discuss the Bible. So if you're not involved yet, we just um, encourage you to ask about one of the Bible studies. I teach one on Wednesday mornings at 10 o'clock, and I know there are some on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays that you can look into. So take some time, get to know this really good book, and we'll see you later.
Hi, I want to talk to you about our comeback series. We're calling it The Comeback is Always Stronger Than the Setback. And that is true with God. The, the comeback with God is always uh, better and bigger and stronger than the setback. Because God is better, bigger, stronger. He is the one that overcomes our setbacks. And we're also uh, encouraging you to read a book during the comeback series. It's called Your Comeback by Tony Evans. It has a lot of great uh, Bible stories that he explains that, that are true comeback stories, true God comeback stories. And he also has some, some comeback stories from, from our world today, of uh, companies and sports teams and others who, who had amazing comebacks. And then, you know, we learned some great principles for how God works comebacks in our life. So. Be part of the Comeback series, come back to worship, join in worship, invite somebody else to come back to God or come back uh, to worship and consider getting a copy of Your Comeback by Tony Evans. Available at the church, $10 suggested donation that's well below the uh, cover price and we've got copies available here at the church. Hi, I'm Vanessa Moore. Hi, my name is Wami Newman. And we're your youth leaders here at PFC. We have two separate groups that meet uh, during the week. We have the middle school group, which Warming will tell us about. So the middle school group gets to meet on Wednesday nights at 6.30 to 7.30. And you guys are all welcome. And then we have our high school group that meets from 7 to 8 on Tuesdays. And uh, this group is a lot of fun as well. A little bit more, um, let's see, studious than the middle school group. We have a great group of kids for both of them, and we would love to have your student uh, join us. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact either of us or the church. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 130. I invite you to read along with me. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Like 
Going to move into our time of prayer. Uh, we'll begin by praying the Lord's Prayer and then I'll lead us in our congregational prayer. And following that, I want to invite you to join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed, an ancient uh, creed, a statement of our faith and what we believe in. But before we do all of that, I just want to remind you that prayer is a way that we communicate with God. It's a way that we share our heart with Him in a way that He shares His heart with us. And so as we move into this time of prayer, I invite you to open your heart to really uh, hear what God would have to say to you. Well, let's pray together as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O oh God, we come before you this day and give you thanks uh, for your goodness and for the day that you've set before us. Father, we pray that as we walk through this day that we would walk with you. In these next few moments, we want to share our heart with you. Father, we lift up to you our government leaders, those, that are, those who serve our nation, our state, and even our local community of Palouse. We pray that you would guide and direct them. Lord, we pray for all those who work for justice and for freedom and for peace. Father, we think of those in our world who are facing troubles and trials. And we pray, God, for your presence to be with those who hunger and thirst and for those who face injustice and oppression. May you satisfy their needs. And may you restore them to wholeness. Father, we lift up to you those who are in danger. We think of those uh, reeling from the after effects of wildfires. We think of our partners in Uganda who are suffering uh, more uh, than they should from the COVID-19 uh, spread. Father, we lift them up to you. We entrust them to your care. We ask that you would uh, protect them, that you would bring healing to them. And Father, we lift up to you those who minister to the sick and the friendless and the needy. And we ask for your protection and your care of them as well. Father, we lift up to you your church around the world, your church here in this community. And we ask for you to be with all those who serve you in the church. 
May we all be bearers of your light and hope to those who don't yet know you. May we encourage one another and spur one another on that our lives might be marked by the fruit of your spirit, that we might live in this world in love for our neighbors with joy in our hearts as ambassadors of your peace. May patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control be the hallmarks of our relationships with each other and with the world. Redeeming God, you satisfy our soul's hunger through Jesus, who is the bread of life. Filled with your steadfast love, now let us live in love, sharing with the needy, feeding others with the bread of kindness, tenderness, and forgiveness. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, let us declare together the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed, the statement of our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our second scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Ephesians 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family on earth and on hev and heaven has been named, so that according to the riches in his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We had a fun week this week doing Vacation Bible School down at the City Park in Palouse. And one of the things we talked about with the kids, actually was at my station, we had to talk about this a lot, was our, our mission, our, our giving to Uganda, our partnership with the Hope for All Children Orphanage there in Uganda. And we were talking to the kids about how we can how we can give our gifts, how we can give money, how we can give our prayers, and, and God can use that to bless other people. And I, I was so encouraged to see kids, when they were connecting the dots, realizing that they can make a difference in the lives of others. And they were seeing that God has been kind to them. God has loved them. God has done good stuff for them, and they want to, in turn, do good stuff for others. And so it was really cool to see that this week. I, I don't even know how much money came in yet. I don't do that 
part, but money came in that we're going to be able to use for mattresses and schooling for vacation for the kids in Uganda from the kids at Vacation Bible School. And I just thank you parents and kids who gave. We appreciate it so much. And this just is a, a reminder that we're all called to give because God, out of God's abundant kindness and love, decided to create us, decided to love us, decided to save us through Jesus, decided to give us His Holy Spirit and, and the fruit of the Spirit that comes with the Holy Spirit. God has given, given, given so much to us. So we are called to give back to God and to do good stuff in this world. So please consider giving. Be a joyful giver. There's ways on the screen that you can give. You can give through the website. You can give through the mail. You can give in person. Uh, but be a giver in your life and be part of what God is doing in this world.
I'm excited to be able to bring a message of God's Word to you today. We're going to be in the Good News According to John. That's the fourth book of the New Testament, John chapter 9. It's a long story. I'm going to read the whole chapter, verses 1 uh, through verses 41, all the way to the end of the chapter. It's a story about Jesus healing a man that was born blind. It takes place in Jerusalem. So let's just hear this story. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to, they, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. <clears throat> Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he would do nothing. He could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, 
For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Well, we all take our views of life. We all see life a certain way. We see things the way we see things. And usually the way we see things we think is right. But here's the deal. Only God sees perfectly right, right? So we end up dividing over all kinds of issues uh, because of how we see things, we, whether it's in our living rooms or on social media. And there simply is a better way forward, a better way of seeing. And there is help from Jesus to see our life and our world the way Jesus sees. So let's pray as we hear this message today. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. For you are truly our rock and our redeemer. You alone should we rightly fear. You alone should we fully follow. And you alone should we be founded upon. Give us eyes to see. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So our big point today is to see how Jesus sees, if we can, and, and to just talk about how Jesus sees. So this is a wild story, right? And I want to give you a little bit of background about this man born blind and healed by mud that was made out of Jesus' spit, right? This story takes place in Jerusalem. It takes place during a, a party time, a festival time, the Feast of Tabernacles, a huge celebration of how God had provided for the Israelites back in their history. God had led the, the Israelites, uh, the Hebrew people, through the desert, right? And it, among other things, they, they celebrate that God gave them water when they were in the desert, and they remember that, and they, they celebrate that. They, they celebrate the pillar of fire that God led them with at night that God allowed them to see even in the desert's darkness. And, and this, this Feast of Tabernacles was supposed to be an annual reminder and celebration of how God led them and how God provides. And now Jesus steps into this celebration on this particular year, and he's declaring to the people to believe in him, that he is the water, the living water, that, that will flow out of their heart. He said that in chapter 7. And then he says, he is the light of the world. Right? And he, he says that again. He said that in chapter 8. He says that again here in our story today. And it's some really intense teaching. And uh, the religious leaders were really upset by some of the things that Jesus was saying. That he's the light of the world. That he's living water. And he, he gets into a back and forth with them about who their true spiritual parent is. And they think they're children of Abraham. And he actually tells them, no, you're children of the devil. And it gets to a point where they want to even kill Jesus. They want to kill him. It's an intense series of things that are happening back in chapter 7, chapter 8, now into chapter 9. And, and so they are wanting to kill him after all these intense events. And, and then... Jesus escapes, and you can see in chapter 8, verse 59, if you have your Bible open, that Jesus escapes. And then, after that, is when he comes across this man who was blind from birth. And his disciples who were with him are wondering, you know, a pretty common question for that day for somebody who has this type of, of disability. They're wondering, whose sin caused this man to be born blind? Was it somehow his own sin before he was born? Or was it his parents? And Jesus knows that, man... I want my disciples to see better. I want people to see what's really going on. And so I want to read again verses 3 through 7, and that's really our focus today. So I'll read this part again, starting with verse 3. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so he went and washed and came back seen. Okay, so we're going to talk about that section today in particular. Let's talk about how Jesus sees. First, Jesus sees our true needs. Jesus sees our true needs. Jesus actually sees. He can see what's actually going on. You can pretend as much as you want, but Jesus actually sees how it is. And there was tons of people who didn't actually see this beggar. They didn't actually recognize his face. He was a man easily passed by, easily dismissed. Just another beggar, another hopeless case, right? 
But Jesus sees much deeper than we see. He sees much deeper than the surface level. Jesus sees you. Jesus sees your true needs. Jesus sees what's going on in your mind, in your heart, in your body. Jesus knows. Jesus sees. Let's also see that Jesus sees what we misunderstand. You know, Jesus sees what we misunderstand. There's people who think that God can't heal. That's a misunderstanding. And Jesus sees that. Jesus sees that the disciples misunderstand this situation of why the man was born blind. We don't see clearly, but Jesus sees our misunderstandings. Jesus sees our brokenness. We're, as human beings, we misunderstand. We miscomprehend. We jump to conclusions, right? And so the disciples jump to the conclusion that this guy is blind because of sin, one way or the other, because he either sinned. Well, of course, the blind man's a sinner just like you and I. But it wasn't his sin that caused him to be blind. It wasn't his parents' sin that caused him to be blind. But the disciples thought it was one or the other. And sometimes we have that type of thinking, and it's just wrong. So Jesus sees our misunderstandings. He sees that we don't always get things on our own and that we need help. So one of our uh, often done missteps, and we can see it in our culture a lot right now, is we often jump to blame or accusation. That's what the disciples were doing here, right? Who is to blame, this man or his parents, for his blindness? And, and rather than do what Jesus does, which is he actually has concern and compassion, we like to jump to blame and accusation. The Pharisees, they too in this story, they jump to blame and accusation. They, they're not, they don't jump to joy, excited that a man who was born blind is healed. Instead, they do what we do, and they jump to blame and accusation. And so the uh, disciples say, who's at fault here, right? That's an example of jumping to blame and accusation. Who's at fault for this man's blindness? Now, we need to remember uh, that all of us humans are born into one kind of struggle or another. And, and, and it's, you know, you're not perfect, I'm not perfect. So we should have concern and compassion for others. Just as God has concern and compassion for us, we, 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 you know, we, we often hold people to a higher standard than we hold ourselves to, right? And we should have care and concern for others. So the, the big reason that the Gospel of John is written is because God knows that we misunderstand, that we don't see the world rightly. And God came into the world as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, so that we could see God rightly, so that we could see Jesus the Christ, so that we could believe in Jesus as the Son of God, and that by believing, we could have true life in His name. So He knows that we misunderstand, but wants to give us the right understanding of life. Next thing. Jesus sees our true cure. He sees our true need, right? He sees our true misunderstandings. He sees our true cure. So Jesus knows this man's need for sight. He knows, but he needs more than that. He knows this man needs his soul restored. He knows this man needs his own sins forgiven, like you and I need our sin forgiven. Jesus knows this man's true needs will only be fully met in a spiritually restored relationship with God. This man's needs are truly met by meeting Jesus and having a relationship with Jesus and being made new. So our true cure is just like this man's true cure in this whole story. It goes way beyond physical healing. The physical healing that happens in the beginning of John 9 is just part of it. The, the end of John 9 is the big part, right? That the physical healing allowed the, the deeper spiritual healing to happen in the, in the man. So Jesus knows that he is the light that we need to really see our life rightly. And, and, and remember in this Feast of Tabernacles, I told you that the Israelites, they, they were remembering the great pillar of fire that they had in the desert. But even though they had that pillar of fire, having God's presence as a pillar of fire, it didn't change their heart, right? This, the Pharisees had the scriptures, they had the stories, they had the religious tradition, but it didn't change their heart. They, it didn't, instead of letting the light, God's scriptures, lead them to see God's love, they, they were holding on to them as an idol of sorts. They, they were using them for power and control. God gives us the stories, God gives us his light uh, so that we can see God clearly. And sometimes with religion, we, we hold on to the religion instead of the faith, the traditions, the scriptures leading us to see how God holds on to us, okay? And so they're really the ones who are blind in this story. The religious leaders are blind in this story. Uh, okay, so Jesus sees our true cure, that he is the light that can help us to see 
and that there are religious people who are blind in the story because they won't accept the true cure of Jesus being the light of the world. So the next thing, Jesus sees how things really work. Jesus sees how things really work. Jesus knows that he's been sent on a mission to do the Father's work. Jesus knows that Father God has sent him on a mission to help people see. This is really how Jesus introduces the, the healing of the man's eyes. As he says, you know, I've been sent to do this work. I've got to do this work while there's time to do this work. And so I'm going to heal this guy so that you guys can have sight, basically. So the healing of the blind man's eyes is so that other people there will actually see that there's a God who loves them, who's come to the earth to be the light of the world. He's been sent to do a job, to open people's eyes, to lead people to faith. And he wants their attention. So boy, does he get their attention, right? So, so let's look at how he gets their attention. He gets their attention through this mud and word, through what one of my friends is calling holy spit, okay? Holy spit. Jesus, Jesus uses mud and word. His, his, this mud that he makes that comes at least partly out of himself and from the soil that he had made because all things were made through him. We learned that in John chapter 1. And he uses his word. He says, go and be washed. And the man go goes and is washed and he comes out seeing, right? So this is a weird scene. Can we just say that? Jesus drawing water from himself. Remember he said he's the living water, but here he's drawing water from himself in the form of saliva. And then he combines it with earth, soil, right? And he then makes... Uh, makes something like a paste or a mud that he can put on the man's eyes. And, and we shouldn't foc on, focus on this being some kind of magic mud. This is, a, this is Jesus teaching that the life we need to have our brokenness restored, our blindness uh, turned into sight, it comes from within Jesus. It comes from Jesus. It comes from Jesus remaking us, rebirthing this man's eyes. His eyes hadn't worked since birth, right? But God was going to give his eyes a new birth. God wants to give all of us a new birth. And so, so Jesus is doing this. Now, saliva might seem like a really gross thing to combine. But you know what also seems gross? If you think of it at first glance, it's the cross of Jesus dying a bloody, grotesque death on the cross. Uh, you know, getting nailed through his wrists and his feet. A crown of thorns pushed on his head. You know, just struggling to breathe. That is a grotesque, a difficult scene. But to those who believe that it's God's love, God taking our, our punishment, our sin, dealing with evil, we see it as beautiful. We see it as an act of love. But, you know, it is a grotesque, a difficult scene. And something gross becomes something life-giving, something amazing. You know, I don't think the blind man thought that that mud was gross. I think he thought it was life-giving. It was his eyes being born again, born new. It was something that was made from God. It was truly the saliva of Christ becoming, you know, the presence that that man's eyes needed to live. And it was, it was not that Jesus' spit was magical, right? Because he didn't have to do it this way at all. We know Jesus could heal just with, uh, with a word, right? He could heal with just a touch. But I think he's doing this to make a point, right? He's doing this to make a point that, that life comes from him. We need him. We need, just like he made us out of the earth, we need to be remade, reborn. We live out of everything that He gives us, out of every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is what truly sustains us. The man, the man was healed not by the magical pool of Siloam, but because Jesus said to go to that pool, and the man believed and obeyed Him, and therefore He's healed. So it's joyous, it's amazing, and everybody there should have been rejoicing and just amazed. A man blind from birth had been healed, and yet sadly, that's not what we see. We see a world that's confused, a world that's upset, and a world that wants to control instead of rejoice. And that's still the kind of world we often have today, right? Next week, we're going to talk about, with the same story, we're going to talk about the responses to this story, okay? Uh, but, but I want to wrap up now just with a question. Do we see how Jesus sees? And how can we? Do you see how Jesus sees? Do you want to see how Jesus sees? Don't you want to be somebody who sees opportunities to heal people rather than opportunities to, to judge or condemn? Right? Jesus saw this man's need. He saw he could do something about it. 
Do you want to be somebody who sees the world and sees the world's needs, but you also see, I can do something about it. With God's help, I can do something about it. This, this scene that we heard today, it, yeah, the, the mud part is super weird and kind of gross, but God makes it awesome as well. It, this is a super joyous, super amazing story. Nothing like this has happened in the history of the world before. And yet, the religious people don't rejoice. Wow. We don't want to be those religious people who are missing what God is doing. We want to be people who rejoice along with God when lives are changed, when people's eyes are open to God's love, right? There, we need to care more about God than our churchiness. We need to care more about God than the things in the church building. We need to care more about how Jesus sees the world, right? That's what we need to care about. So Jesus saw an opportunity to change a man's life. Jesus saw an opportunity to open the eyes of the people in the crowd. So let's pray that we aren't limited to see, right? We need Jesus to help us see. We need to look to the cross and see not something grotesque, but God's amazing love, right? Amazing love. So maybe you're grossed out by the story of this mud. But if, if that mud helped you to see, I bet you'd receive it. And I want you to know that whether you have questions about the cross, if the Son of God truly did go to the cross and that is the way sin is forgiven and that is the way death is defeated, then I ask you to receive that gift from God. Believe that that's what makes you new. That's what gives you new life. It wipes away all your sins, wipes away death, death for you because Jesus died in your place. Might be challenged by that, but it's good news. So God sees rightly, friends. God sees you. God sees your hurts. God sees your pain. God sees the parts of your life that you think are broken and can't work, right? But he came to give you his presence and his life. And he has the true and real and lasting cure for you. He loves you and he wants you to see as he sees. Let's pray. God, thank you for opening our eyes and helping us to see the love of Christ. If there's anyone out there that hasn't truly seen how you love them, I pray that you would open their eyes right now and that they would believe that you love them and that you gave your very self for them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The next steps, I have four of them today. You can see them on the screen. You can feel free to comment. You can write to us via email next at palousechurch.org. The first step is, you know what? I just want to declare I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. That's number one. If you want to say that, do that. If this is the first time, let us just know that, you know, I'm believing today for the first time. Give me a call. Send me a message next at pollucechurch.org. Let me know if this is the first time you said, I believe that Jesus uh, uh, died for me, that Jesus rose from the grave for me. Okay? If you want to know more about miracles, because this story involved miracles, and maybe you just want to know about more about them, I'd love to talk to you about that. That's number two. Uh, if you want to just pray a real quick prayer, if you want to pray this prayer throughout your week coming up, Lord, help me to see how Jesus sees. That's a real easy prayer to do. You can pray it throughout your day this week. Join me in praying this prayer. Lord, help me to see how Jesus sees. That's number three. Okay? And if you want to say, I'm going to be here for next week, part two of this same story where we talk about more of what was going on in John chapter 9, hey, you can declare that too and then and then be here next week online or in person. All right. Thanks be to God for his word.
Hey everyone, God loves us. That, that's how Jesus sees you, is, is a person that He loves. He loves you. And He loves all people. And He wants us to see how He sees. So my prayer this week is, Lord, help me to see how Jesus sees. Give me your eyes to see. Help me not to jump to uh, conclusions that are wrong. Help me to see where I can do good in my week this week. May we all uh, live this week longing to see how Jesus sees.